we'll start the program now. A respected yes. person, Dr. Rudi Kumar Sir, the president of our South Zone IPS, Professor of Psychiatry, Narayana Medical College, Nelu, and today's speaker, Dr. Venkat Spuramanian, Professor of Psychiatry, Minhas Bangalore, and moderator, Dr. Nuru Hassan, consultant psychiatrist of Sneha Maker Hospital, Tamil Valley, Dr. Aswath Babu, co consultant psychiatrist of Sneha Hospital, Tamil Valley, my dear colleagues, Practicing psychiatrists, postgraduates, very good morning to all of you. It's indeed a great privilege for me to argue the Deval webinar. I welcome you all uh, uh, to the Deval webinar. And today's aim is the eighth one in the Deval monthly series. We are conducting this webinar on every fourth Sunday. But there is a overwhelming response uh, from the audience. And we are selecting a topic in such a way that it is very useful for the uh, postgraduates and also it will be very, very efficient for the uh, consultant psychiatrist also. And also, we selected a speaker with a eminent personality. For example, today we have uh, Dr. Venkata Surunian, a professor of psychiatry at the uh, Dr. Venkata Surunian is an international speaker and is uh, living in Encyclopedia. So, Dr. Venkata has to accept that to come uh, for this hour. That's a great uh, happy for all of us. And uh, Dr. Venkat is going to speak on the topic philosophy, current and clinical perspective. Hope this topic will be useful for the postgraduates and as well as for the practicing psychiatrists. And with this, I request Dr. Nurul Hassan and Aswad Babu to take over this session. Thank you, sir. Uh, very good morning to one of all present here. Am I audio you clear? Is it audible? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I would like to start with thanking Dr. Panisalan sir for giving me yet again an opportunity to moderate this session. Uh, I would really like to take the privilege of uh, introducing today's chairperson, Dr. Kadiveti Uday Kumar sir. Uh, I would like to start with uh, say like uh, it is an uh, honor to uh, introduce uh, sir who doesn't uh, need any introduction at all. But then uh, for the fellow PGs out here. Dr. Kadivati Uday Kumar sir had done both BPM and MD from Nimhams. He is currently working as Professor of Psychiatry at Narayana Medical College, Nellur. He is the Director of SIMANS, which includes OP Center at Nellur and a Rehab Center catered to Schizophrenia, Addictive Disorders and Homeless Persons with Mental Illness. He had served as Editor, President of United EAP and Secretary of South Zone. He is the Convener of APS Community, Mental Health and Awareness Community. Uh, he had conducted many conferences at state level, zonal level, and also national level. He is currently the serving president of uh, Indian Psychiatric Society, South Zonal Branch. Sir, uh, it is a honor to introduce you. Beauty of him is his humbleness. Whenever I tried to reach him, he was very courteous enough to reply within a minute. And uh, he was very warm in uh, attending the session. Sir, thank you, sir. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, today we'll go on. Yes, sir. Uh, sure, sir. Uh, now it is uh, yeah. time for yeah. you to introduce the topic. Sir. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. It's a golden opportunity to be with you. Uh, thank you for the good uh, remarks on me. Uh, first of all, I would uh, like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Paneer uh, Selvam and his team to organize this kind of uh, educative program towards the uh, PGs and other participants. Uh, like all the consultants, uh, probably this is the eighth program for the last uh, nine months, uh, uh, if I'm correct. I think uh, I request all other uh, states also should uh, replicate this uh, platform, I think, which is very useful. I join the hands of organizers to welcome all the uh, PGs and the participants uh, to this event. Uh, today we have a topic called... Uh, close up in and the, the current clinical perspectives uh, to deal we have a very very eminent uh, professor of psychiatry the legendary researcher uh, from nimans uh, uh, the uh, uh, probably the, the best uh, 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 person like uh, no 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 uh, person like him we would get to this uh, platform I think he's the apt uh, person uh, to say and clear all the doubts about uh, the close-up and he's none other than Dr. Venkat uh, Subramanian, sir. About uh, close-up in, I think, the 1960s and 70s uh, in Germans, 
have uh, had brought this molecule into the market and then quickly withdrawn because of the uh, side effects uh, like agranulocytosis and neutropenia. But uh, uh, in 1990, I think FDA has approved and then brought into the market to especially to reduce suicidal ideas, uh, attempts, and risks of uh, risks in uh, especially schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder. And then FDA has approved this molecule and then currently declares that it is the drug of choice for the uh, treatment resistant uh, schizophrenia. Average rating of uh, 7.9 out of uh, 10 uh, on drugs.com, which shows the uh, clinical efficacy of this uh, molecule and said to be uh, cutting off all the chances of hospital admissions and uh, drug discontinuations. I think probably this is the uh, positive side. Uh, probably there are many number of other negative uh, aspects of uh, this molecule also. But uh, whatever is written then, uh, some of the consultants are uh, using left and right about this molecule, even in the uh, first episode to resistant to schizophrenia, I found uh, uh, no uh, uh, side effects at all. Probably there are uh, com uh, some common uh, side effects like uh, sedation, hypersalivation, and constipation, weight gain. Those are all uh, common uh, when you deal them, it's not a problem. But agranulocytosis, which we are all scared, but it is not uh, commonly seen at all. I think uh, uh, we have a strong hope that we can be used this. Uh, I think uh, lots uh, to be known about this uh, molecule. Uh, uh, I think uh, Dr. Venkat Subramanian sir is ready to clarify all the doubts about this molecule. I think uh, uh, I welcome uh, once again all the uh, PGs and uh, the participants of today. I wish the CME uh, go success. Uh, event. Thank you, sir. Thank you for calling me and making me to chair this session. Thank you, Panir Selvam and Ashwat and other uh, Hassan, Nurul Hassan and everybody. Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning, everyone. So thank you for the for your great words and introduction, sir. So here I have uh, one uh, communication. Uh, we usually, the speaker usually asks uh, five MCQs along the uh, course of the session. So people who are answering the, in the first three places in the chat box will be selected and given the prizes. So in the last uh, session, uh, in the Evolve 7 meet, we have uh, uh, six winners uh, for the MCQs asked. Uh, they are uh, Srini Pakas Siddharth, Kanaga Mahalakshmi, Kalai Selvi, Shamini, Abhita, and Vinayak Hegde. Uh, with this, I will move into the uh, speaker introduction. Uh, sir, I deem it a great honor and privilege to introduce the speaker in this monthly postgraduate training program. Um, my heart is filled with joy and nostalgia to introduce my teacher from Nimhans, uh, who is a birthplace, birthplace for many great psychiatrists all over the world. Dr. G. Venkata Subramanian, sir, completed his MBBS from Stanley Medical College, Tamil Nadu. He completed his MD in psychiatry from a prestigious National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences, Bangalore. He also completed his PhD in psychiatry from the same institute. Currently, he is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry. Also, he is currently the head of Department of Clinical Neurosciences and Translational Psychiatry Lab, Nimhans. Sir has been in the teaching psychiatry for more than two decades. He has been a research guide to students across many specialties from psychiatry, clinical neurosciences, neuroimaging, nursing, and to the biotechnological background also. His main areas of interest are schizophrenia, transcranial direct current stimulation, neuroimaging, clinical neurobiology, psychoneuroimmunology, psychopharmacology, and metabolic syndrome. Uh, SAR has more than 410 PubMed index publications and uh, he is a recipient of many national, international awards and grants. Dr. Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award for Medical Sciences, ICMR Vidyasagar Award, 
INSA Young Scientist Award. These are some of the very central awards to quote, and he has many, he has, he's a recipient of many awards. And um, finally, uh, so ignition of hope in minds and creation of longing feel in the hearts are the attributes of knowledge centric gathering. I hope your presentation deserves such a great position, sir. Uh, with this small introduction, I request Dr. G. Mekar Superman, sir, to deliver his talk on close up in the current clinical perspectives. Sir, the online dice is yours. Thank you. Yeah, uh, my screen is visible, sir. Yes, yes sir. sir. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so good morning, all. And uh, <clears throat> at the outset, I wish to thank uh, Dr. Panni Selvan and uh, Dr. Noorul and team for this opportunity. I'm quite delighted and honored to be a part of this uh, important program. I'm happy to learn that uh, this Evolve program has attracted a lot of uh, participation. It's a commendable job the team is uh, doing and uh, thanks for the opportunity. And uh, thanks uh, Dr. Uday Kumar as well as uh, Dr. Noel for very, very generous uh, comments about uh, me in their introductory remarks. And uh, I'm extremely grateful for your kind words. Um, yeah, so, so in, in this uh, session, I, I wish to share uh, some of the current perspectives uh, with respect to the clinical status of uh, clozapine. Now, as uh, Dr. Uday Kumar uh, mentioned in his introductory remarks, that the, the history of clozapine is an inspiring journey. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, the history of uh, medication discoveries in psychiatry, there are uh, two important landmarks that happened. One is uh, chlorpromazine in the early 1950s. Um, and, and the second, somewhere in 1958, uh, this clozapine was uh, uh, discovered. And uh, like it, it was mentioned, uh, when clozapine was initially used, uh, the concerning side effect of A granulocytosis made this molecule to disappear uh, for few years. But the story of clozapine is a blend of uh, medical misconceptions, public health scares, and accusation of company profiteering. So that, that was the initial period. Uh, there were uh, many points uh, during the initial discovery, clozapine was almost abandoned, but many other forces, so sometimes it was personal, medical and political repeatedly revived it as a viable and important medication for those with treatment resistant schizophrenia. It is noteworthy uh, the publication by uh, Dr. Kane and colleagues uh, that, that appeared um, in 1988 in archives of general psychiatry. So this, this is considered as a landmark publication, which was a major evidence that brought clozapine back into the clinical uh, applications. And if, if you look at many, many years after that, uh, the, the slide summarizes the comparative efficacy um, and tolerability of 32 antipsychotics um, in, in schizophrenia. And if you look at uh, the overall uh, change in symptoms efficacy, clozapine is rated as the best. So, so with, with this context, I will move into the topic. Of course, we all know uh, schizophrenia is a critically uh, disabling disorder, and it is also uh, significant to observe that schizophrenia perhaps is the most disabling disease. So this is a publication that appeared in uh, Lancet uh, about a decade before, which uh, emphasized schizophrenia's disabling status as a disorder that confers the maximum disability. And we know that uh, schizophrenia has its onset with a gene environmental interaction uh, with its risk being decided in the, in the prenatal stage as well as by the genetic diathesis. And around the peri-adolescent period because of uh, several stressful context, drug abuse, or sometimes it could be features like migration, the onset of the disease happens. And the first episode is followed by a fluctuating course and 
in majority of the patients, the disorder has a lifelong trajectory. And this kind of course is also um, uh, associated with various changes in the biology of the brain, starting from the brain formation, brain reorganization, as well as the brain upkeep. The reason I put forth this slide, especially from uh, a clinician's perspective is, if you look at the emerging neurobiological research as well as clinical research, if we want to optimally treat schizophrenia, there is a window of opportunity, which usually is around uh, the, the stage of onset of the disease and in the initial few years. The relevance of this uh, neurobiological observation in the context of clozapine is something which I'll be emphasizing as we go along. Now, in, in schizophrenia, we know that about 30% uh, of uh, patients uh, have uh, resistant symptoms. But what is important to notice, treatment resistance in schizophrenia uh, contributes to a maximum burden due to this disorder, like as much as about 80%. And this is where the role of clozapine becomes important because clozapine is recommended for individuals with treatment-resistant schizophrenia. But if you look at the definition of treatment-resistant schizophrenia, as it is summarized by an uh, influential paper that was published by Dr. Hovis and colleagues, which is uh, the TRIP guidelines, that is Treatment, Response, and Resistance in Psychosis. Uh, the TRIP working group did a detailed systematic review and in that, there were very uh, significant uh, observations, uh, which, which actually revisited the key elements to define treatment resistance in schizophrenia. Uh, the first and foremost is the diagnosis of schizophrenia has to be on a validated criteria. And before making an impression of treatment resistance, we also need to ensure that the pharmacological treatment is adequate. And importantly, despite adequate pharmacological treatment, the symptoms, especially the significant disabling symptoms should be persistent. So in that context, when uh, Dr. Hovis and colleagues reviewed the existing literature till then, uh, during the time of publication, um, especially looking at studies that have examined treatment resistant schizophrenia patient, it was uh, surprising to note that only about 50% of studies had used operationalized criteria. And within those 50% studies, that is 50% of uh, 42 studies summarized is about 21%. And of those uh, entire group of studies, only two studies have used the same criteria. So this was a, a significant uh, concern. And this is uh, the, the summary of how different aspects of treatment resistance, starting from adherence, operationalization criteria, and say even the trial duration, minimum dose of chlorpromazine equivalent. So some of the fundamental principles of treatment resistance were suboptimally examined in uh, most of the um, existing uh, literature. So this is where uh, the, 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 the TRIP recommendations uh, have given uh, recent uh, guidelines, uh, which of course, many of these components are emphasizing what has been already uh, defined as a consensus criteria, but critically, the TRIP recommendation operationalizes uh, the treatment guidelines. Number one, at least there has to be two antipsychotic trial with different antipsychotic medications, at least six weeks at a therapeutic dosage of medication for each of these molecules. And importantly, the adherence has to be ascertained. Um, at least 80% of prescribed dosage should be taken. And in, in this, the therapeutic dosage of medication as per the TRIPS guideline was defined as the midpoint of the target range of acute treatment of schizophrenia and or the, the equivalence with respect to chlorpromazine should be as much as at least six, 600 milligram. And of course, there are other factors that has been uh, emphasized. Uh, this is something which they call as optimal uh, criteria. Of course, this is something which need not be considered as mandatory for clinical practice. But if, if this, any of these criteria is 
uh, implemented, then that makes the treatment resistance definition more optimal. At least one antipsychotic blood level, especially to ad ad assess adherence. Perhaps this criteria is motivated by uh, the context in majority of uh, the Western countries, uh, in which uh, uh, many a time the adherence or the, the supervision of uh, treatment of uh, schizophrenia may not be ascertained by a reliable uh, information from a caregiver. Whereas in our setting, luckily, a majority of the patients will have at least one reliable uh, information source uh, through a caregiver. And of course, the, the, the adherence is something which uh, these guidelines emphasize again and again. So this is uh, the summary uh, table that was published in this uh, guideline. I would uh, strongly recommend the postgraduates to read through this article. You know, this article is available as open source and uh, full text can be downloaded from the journal website that is the American Psychiatry. Now they, they talk about the minimum requirement in this guideline, which is basically uh, a set of criteria that is sufficient for practice. Uh, whereas there is an optimum requirement which can enhance the rigorosity of uh, the diagnosis of uh, treatment resistance. Now, in this context, I want to reflect on uh, some of the uh, contemporary um, concepts that are uh, emphasized. One is when we approach a, a patient with schizophrenia and make an impression of treatment resistance, we need to be cognizant of treatment resistant schizophrenia versus uh, what literature calls as pseudo-resistant schizophrenia. So this is important, especially because uh, sometimes non-adherence or co-occurrent substance abuse, sometimes medical disorders or other medications affecting the antipsychotic pharmacokinetics or pharmacodynamics. And also importantly, there are occasions where adverse and detrimental psychosocial conditions can mimic as persistent uh, symptoms in psychosis or can influence the persistence of uh, uh, symptoms in schizophrenia. Uh, so, uh, let me give an example in the sense like when we treat somebody who, who presents with the first episode psychosis, treat with any of the first line antipsychotic, say for instance, risperidone, valanzapine or amisulpiride, um, and the patient shows very good response. And after a few months, Despite um, optimal adherence, it could be that the patient may present with a relapse of symptoms. And in that context, one uh, patient may have a relapse mainly because of this ad adverse and detrimental psychosocial condition. So, so we, we need to kind of look at when a person relapses and when the person presents with persistent symptoms, whether any of these factors uh, influence the uh, the non-response. And in that context, one other concept that is re-emerging is what is called as dopamine supersensitivity psychosis. Dopamine supersensitivity psychosis uh, Hello, uh, am, am I audible? My audio is clear? Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can to see, sir. Okay, okay. Thank you. So, so the dopamine supersensitivity psychosis uh, actually uh, became an interesting concept, especially from uh, this uh, particular uh, trial uh, that was published in JAMA Psychiatry, where there was an observation, dose reduction of antipsychotics during early stages of remitted first episode psychosis actually showed superior long-term recovery rates compared with the, the rates achieved by the maintenance uh, treatment. So, so this uh, one of the possibilities uh, that was suggested in this uh, paper was uh, uh, dopamine supersensitivity. Uh, especially the dop dopamine supersensitivity, if you want to look at uh, a quick summary of the neurobiology, if we over treat uh, schizophrenia, that is over antagonize the D2 receptor using antipsychotics, the dopamine receptors may move into what is called as a super sensitivity state which in turn may lead to relapse of symptoms. So dopamine supersensitivity psychosis is a, actually an old concept that was put forth by Chovinard and colleagues in 1970s. Um, 
this is uh, uh, especially important in patients where uh, we see relapse of symptoms with co-occurring dyskinetic movements. So recently, this has been kind of operationalized. The criteria for dopamine supersensitivity psychosis is operationalized, uh, which basically is uh, com comprised of three important components. One is uh, when a patient with schizophrenia has to be diagnosed as DSP, that is the dopamine super uh, sensitivity psychosis. You know, DSP is not referring to a recent movie that was uh, referred in, that was released in Tamil Nadu sometime before. So here it is a dopamine super sensitivity psychosis. So there has to be a continued intake of antipsychotic for at least more than three months. And in that context, there has to be a presence of rebound psychosis, which is basically a relapse of psychosis that occurs immediately after the reduction or cessation or change of antipsychotics. So that's number one. And there will be a tolerance to antipsychotic effect that will be observed. That is, when severe psychotic symptoms or other positive symptoms emerge, a higher dose, that is, if you treat a patient with, say, for instance, six milligram of risperidone, and there is uh, the patient has shown significant response. And since the patient has improved very well, and when there is a dose reduction was attempted, say from six to four, there is a relapse of uh, symptoms or a worsening of symptoms. And further dose reduction actually uh, leads to paradoxical increase in the symptoms so, so, uh, or non-response of the symptoms. So this is uh, called as a tolerance to antipsychotic effect. And then there is a persistence of uh, tardive dyskinesia. So if these features are present, then dopamine supersensitivity uh, needs to be kept in mind. The reason why I am emphasizing on dopamine supersensitivity is sometimes uh, dopamine supersensitivity psychosis may be misinterpreted as a treatment resistant uh, schizophrenia. And uh, in which case, of course, uh, other attempts like usage of long hacking antipsychotic uh, injectable uh, medication or certain other molecules like quetiapine could be tried, which are weak D2 antagonists. There is also a role for clozapine, but before labeling such people with treatment-resistant schizophrenia, we need to consider the possibility of dopamine uh, supersensitivity psychosis. The second important uh, concept in the contemporary approach to clozapine I want to emphasize is treatment resistance versus resistant to treatment. Now, uh, this is an important phenomena uh, which became very clear with this publication uh, where uh, the McCutcheon and colleagues, when they observed uh, people that were referred to close up in clinics, and those people before uh, close up in was initiated, the blood levels of the existing antipsychotic uh, uh, treatment that uh, was uh, assessed, and uh, as much as 19% uh, you know, of those 36 patients. Uh, uh, showed undetectable level of uh, antipsychotics. So this is this is something which is important. And uh, so this is where we need to be um, cognizant of uh, whether the existing treatment is indeed effective in terms of its bioavailability. So, so this is one aspect which is also getting emphasized, that is uh, treatment resistance versus resistant to treatment. Now, moving on to some of the robust evidence, uh, which, is, which is getting emphasized and re-emphasized in terms of the superior efficacy of uh, clozapine in uh, schizophrenia. Now, this is a paper which was published in Lloyd and colleagues uh, about um, a decade before, which examined the comparative efficacy and tolerability of 15 different antipsychotics in uh, schizophrenia. So in, in that, Clozapine was ranked as the first molecule, and of course, amisulpride and many other molecules followed the superior efficacy ranking of clozapine. And if you look at a much more uh, a recent study that was actually looked at the real world effectiveness of antipsychotic treatment in a large cohort of schizophrenia patients, you know, 29,000 plus patients, uh, and clozapine was uh, found to be amongst the best. and uh, the next came the treatment option with long-acting injectable antipsychotic, which, which had the highest rates of prevention of relapse in schizophrenia. I think this is the piece of evidence which Dr. Uday Kumar was referring to in his introductory remark. 
Now, what is very important is if you look at uh, the treatment failure um, risk or treatment failure profile, uh, which with any monotherapy in comparison with, say, for instance, oral lazapine that was uh, done in the study, uh, again, clozapine fared the best, and then we had a series of uh, long acting injectable antipsychotics. Now, there is also other interesting uh, summaries that have been published, uh, especially looking at in non-randomized cohort studies, how does clozopine compare with other sec second generation antipsychotics? So this is a, a, a slightly different question that was examined by Matsuda and colleagues in a paper that was published a few years before. Uh, the important aspect of this study is it is a systematic uh, uh, review as well as meta-analysis of a large number of participants, more than a lakh participants across uh, 63 studies. Um, if we look at uh, the summary statement, although more severely ill patients received clozopine, the use of clozopine was associated with reduced hospitalization, all-cause discontinuation, and reduced overall symptoms. However, you know, there was a higher risk for cardiometabolic outcomes. You know, that is something which we need careful monitoring when we treat people with close by. Now, in that context, how, if you look at some of the current perspectives in terms of how we can optimize the utility of uh, clozapine in uh, schizophrenia, one important aspect that uh, we need to pay attention is uh, uh, the trajectory of emergence of treatment resistance in schizophrenia. Now, if you look at uh, the, the treatment resistance in schizophrenia, the TRIP guidelines uh, gives a, a kind of qualifier, which says a group of patients may have actually early onset treatment resistance, that is treatment resistance from within the first year of treatment. Another group may have a medium term onset in treatment resistance, that is one to five years. And the third group may have a late onset treatment resistance. And this is where some interesting uh, leads are emerging. That is, in treatment resistant uh, schizophrenia, the dopamine uh, hyperactivity status may not be all that prevalent. Uh, you know, so this is a paper that was uh, published in, uh, by uh, Demja and colleagues in about again, again, again a decade before that showed significantly increased dopamine synthesis capacity in responders to treatment in relation to the uh, patient with treatment resistant schizophrenia. So based on some of uh, these kinds of observations, you know, there is a proposal of uh, subtyping schizophrenia as type A, you know, which is characterized by hyper dopaminergic uh, subgroup and uh, type B, which is normal dopaminergic subgroup. And it is likely that the type A patients will respond to dopamine blocking drugs, whereas the type B, you know, these are the patients where there is no elevation in dopamine may not respond. So, so perhaps this is the group of uh, patient uh, that may benefit with early treatment uh, using um, uh, clozapine. The reason I'm emphasizing this uh, particular uh, approach as well as the potential neurobiological correlates is there are now interesting leads that are emerging, especially using what are called as magnetic resonance spectroscopic brain imaging studies, uh, which can be implemented in most of the existing MRI scanners. And this is a largely automated uh, procedure. So through that, the brain chemicals, especially the glutamate, could be measured and quantified. And that may have some relevance in predicting who may be responding to clozopine differentially, which means there is a possibility in times to come uh, using some procedures like this, we might be able to preemptively initiate clozopine. So coming to the trajectory of uh, the treatment resistance in terms of its emergence over the course of schizophrenia, as much as 70% of treatment resistant patients they had an early resistance. So, so that is something which is very important, which means uh, these are people who could be identified quite early in the trajectory. And if we can optimize the initiation of clozapine in this group of patients, there is a tremendous potential with which we can handle the challenge of treatment resistance in schizophrenia. Uh, mainly because uh, studies have shown that perhaps that could be some kind of a critical window 
um, uh, with which uh, we can use uh, clozapine in an effective way in schizophrenia. Mainly because in schizophrenia patients, when we were uh, looking at you know, the literature, including the ones that uh, from Imhans, we were looking at the, the data, schizophrenia patients whose uh, treatment with clozapine was initiated in the context of treatment resistance, actually there was a significant delay. And those patients in whom uh, the initiation was much earlier, in the, even after diagnosing the treatment resistance, the, the, the response was better. And, and if you look at the clinical practice, uh, you know, even including some of the data from our institute, the mean delay in initiating close-up in ranges anywhere between two to five years. That is after the diagnosis of treatment resistance. So this is an important uh, window uh, of opportunity which has to be utilized optimally. So this is how the definition of delay of uh, onset in close uh, treatment is measured. That is, if you look at the schematic representation here, the onset of first episode of schizophrenia is marked by this arrow. So then the person is treated with first antipsychotic, second antipsychotic. Then after the two antipsychotic treatment, uh, if there is no uh, optimal response, then this is where the, the onset of treatment resistance come. And many a time, uh, it's our usual uh, approach to look at uh, you know, additional antipsychotic uh, trials, you know, and then we go for the initiation of clozapine. This uh, period, that is the onset of treatment resistance to initiation of clozapine, if it could be reduced as much as possible, the response to clozapine will be the best. I think this is one major factor that influences the contemporary practice of clozapine, and there is a window of great opportunity which has to be uh, optimally uh, utilized. The so delay in initiating clozapine is a predictor of outcome in response to clozapine. And interestingly, if you look at the existing literature, uh, a delay of even as much as up to 2.8 years was still uh, a good predictive cutoff. That is even if, if, if the delay is as much as up to three years, uh, still the uh, data suggested that clozapine was associated, the, the prescription of clozapine was associated with an optimal clinical response. So this is something which is worth noticing. Now, in this context, especially, you know, the point that I mentioned, uh, the, the risk of metabolic side effects with uh, clozapine, there is a emerging perspective on the utility of clozapine fluoxamine combination, mainly because of uh, the pharmaco kinetic interaction between uh, you know, different molecules and clozapine metabolism. If you look at this uh, schema, the clozapine is metabolized predominantly by uh, CYP1A2 and CYP3A4, with CYP1A2 enzyme converting clozapine to not clozapine. And uh, there are certain uh, molecules, say for instance, the rifampicin is an um, inducer of this uh, uh, pathway, that is CYP1A2, whereas usage of caffeine, SSRIs, and certain common antipsychotics like erythromycin, they are inhibitors of clozapine metabolism. And importantly, smoking is a key variable that again induces the metabolism of clozapine. And this is one factor we need to be cognizant of when we treat people with clozapine. Now, the clozapine fluoxamine utility is emphasized by the inhibitory effects of SSRIs on the conversion of clozapine to not clozapine through the CYP1A2 enzyme metabolism. The importance of uh, this particular pharmacokinetic is mainly because not clozapine has been shown to have a higher antagonist activity on the 5-HT2C receptor. And NAR clozapine also exhibits uh, muscarinic and uh, D2 partial agonist activity. Uh, now, the more potent 5-HT2C antagonism induced by NAR clozapine perhaps is the reason for the risk of weight gain, hyperglycemia, and hyperlipidemia. So, so if we are able to increase the clozapine is to NAR clozapine ratio, that is by inhibiting the metabolic conversion of clozapine to nor clozapine, 
there is a potential to reduce the risk for metabolic side effects due to clozapine. So this is a study that has looked at the effect of adjunctive fluoxamine in which the schizophrenia patients were randomized to receive uh, 50 milligram of fluoxamine plus 100 milligram of clozapine or a monotherapy with 300 milligram of clozapine per day. The study observations were that clozapine fluoxamine combination significantly attenuated the increments in body weight, insulin resistance, and the levels of insulin and glucose abnormalities, as well as the triglyceride elevation. Equally important is that the combined treatment group showed significant reduction in Panas's general psychopathology scores in comparison with the monotherapy group. And compared with clozapine monotherapy, adjunct uh, treatment with fluoxamine um, has the potential to alleviate the metabolic uh, side effect and without any compromise on the clinical effect. An important point I want to emphasize here is when we use this combination, we have to be extremely careful, especially because uh, fluoxamine can inhibit the metabolism of uh, clozapine with very high uh, effectiveness to the extent that there could be unpredictable higher serum levels of clozapine. So it is always a, a good idea to uh, monitor the levels of clozapine uh, in if possible uh, using the clozapine assay or uh, titrating the clozapine as well as fluoxamine in a very, very slow and gradual and careful fashion with close monitoring for uh, potential uh, side effects due to clozapine. And uh, I, I just want to emphasize some of our uh, interesting observations in this context, especially the utility of uh, clozapine in people with the diabetes mellitus. And uh, we know that clozapine is one of the most underutilized psychotropic agents, um, especially due to the delay in the initiation of clozapine, as well as our concern with respect to several side effects of clozapine, including the metabolic side effect. And uh, if you look at some of the recent literature, it suggests that clozapine is less likely to induce as much diabetes as it was predicted in the earlier uh, literature. So, so that is something which we have also been able to observe in our cohort. And uh, there is a, a good number of patients in our clinic who have diabetes, but because of treatment resistance and no other uh, alternative options of antipsychotic, we have been able to initiate them on uh, clozapine and maintain them with a good clinical response without significant worsening of uh, the diabetes status. Of course, all these patients are also treated with anti-diabetics and we work in liaison with the diabetes experts. And just a brief note about the clozapine and COVID-19. Um, this is important because we know that any systemic inflammation can increase clozapine level. And clozapine, especially when we initiate clozapine, can cause inflammation. That's why some of the patients may present with the uh, fever when we initiate clozapine. And clozapine can also risk, increase the risk of infection. And clozapine is also known to be associated with uh, uh, risk of pneumonia. So, so this is something which we need to be very um, uh, careful uh, in terms of uh, clozapine in the times of COVID. Of course, now COVID risk has slowly been waning away, but we are facing different types of uh, viruses, for instance, H3N2 related infection. Many of these principles that were uh, reported, principles and observations that were documented during the times of COVID um, are important for any viral uh, infection, especially because um, such uh, uh, clinical instances that is co-occurring infection can at one level uh, increasing the system may increase the level of clozapine uh, that could be elevated risk for some other side effect. Speaker, sir, kindly unmute yourself, sir. Speaker, sir, kindly unmute yourself, sir. Yes, 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 I, I have unmuted. Thank you. Yes. So coming to the last few slides in terms of a summary overview of uh, the current perspectives on uh, clozapine. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, I, I think it got, now it, it is uh, unmuted. Am I, am I audible, sir? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so now that we know from various existing evidence when clozapine is used in treatment-resistant schizophrenia, 
uh, there is a natural question whether clozapine, whether we can use it as a first or a second line antipsychotics. Um, now, there are very few studies that have looked at the utility of clozapine as a first line antipsychotic. Those studies did not show definitive evidence for superior clinical benefits of clozapine in first episode schizophrenia patients in comparison to other antipsychotic agents. It could be due to the clinical uh, neurobiological observation that I um, uh, presented in one of the, the earlier slides. Perhaps the group of people that respond to clozopine may not be the ones that have a hyperdopaminergic state. And the hyperdopaminergic state associated psychosis perhaps may respond as well to any other antipsychotic uh, other than clozopine. So, uh, if uh, the question uh, is that whether clozapine could be considered as a first-line antipsychotic drug, the answer is no, not it. But there is some recent evidence to suggest there may be a case to consider clozapine as a second-line antipsychotic. Uh, but uh, this is the this is observation which mainly comes from the optimized clinical trial. Uh, you know, in, in which they, the, the researchers observed when we went for a, a second uh, line antipsychotic before going for clozapine, there is a, op, there is a possibility of one in three non-responder responding to the second line. That is, when we treat people with antipsychotic number one, about 60% respond. Uh, in the remaining 40%, if we try a molecule other than clozapine, there is a one in three response. So it is still worth trying a second line antipsychotic before uh, going for uh, clozapine. And we also need to uh, keep in mind there are some predictors of good response to clozapine. Number one is shorter duration of illness, higher baseline clinical uh, symptoms, higher functioning in the years before clozapine initiation, and coexisting affective symptoms. Um, and also there are uh, certain symptoms which may make us prefer clozapine. Number one, high risk for suicide. There is a persistent severe aggression, greater risk for extrapyramidal side effects, severe polydipsia. And there is also a suggestion that if a patient has cannabis dependence, we may prefer clozapine preemptively. The reason I'm mentioning these set of uh, clinical points is uh, that could be a situation where when we treat a patient with a first-line antipsychotic and say, for instance, I initiate treatment with risperidone and there is absolutely no response. And if this patient has many of the good predictors of response to clozapine, as well as there are certain concerning clinical factors uh, in terms of high risk for suicide, persistent severe aggression, and this patient uh, whom I treated with risperidone uh, I find them to have an extreme sensitive for extrapyramidal side effect. Um, I, so uh, which in, in such a clinical situation, on a selected subset of uh, patients, uh, we may want to use clozapine even as a second line antipsychotic, but with specific informed consent and explaining the risk benefit ratio. Now, if I have to summarize the specific clinical indications for clozapine, of course, treatment-resistant schizophrenia and recurrent suicidality in schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. These two indications are the ones which are uh, approved by FDA as well. But there are several other clinical situations in which we can consider treatment with clozapine. For instance, psychosis associated with Parkinson's disease, schizophrenia with comorbid alcohol or drug use disorder. It could be alcohol or cannabis. Schizophrenia patients where we find persistent hostility, tardive dyskinesia induced by the antipsychotics, psychogenic polydipsia is an important clinical situation where there is uh, uh, evidence for benefits with clozapine, and treatment-resistant bipolar disorder. Of course, there is some emerging um, evidence to suggest in patients with extreme sensitivity to antipsychotic medication, one may want to consider uh, clozapine preemptively. Coming to the uh, uh, last slide of this section, of course, there are situations where even when we treat people with clozapine, the symptoms may persist. In such uh, instances, perhaps uh, uh, 
combination treatment or add on treatment with amisulpride, risperidone, and uh, aripiprazole and lamotrigine. So, these are the options that uh, I consider as amongst the top and choose the one uh, based on the clinical uh, situation as well as the associated uh, profile of uh, the patient. And of course, in this context, people that do not respond to clozapine, the best evidence is available for add-on electroconvulsive therapy. And if a patient responds very well, then there is even a role for maintenance uh, ECTs. And we have been examining uh, the role of uh, other neuromodulation treatments like uh, the transcranial magnetic current, uh, magnetic stimulation as well as the transcranial direct current stimulation. And of course, there is a set of patients in which psychological and social interventions will be of uh, great benefit. Now, coming to the final set of uh, slides in which how we can conceptualize uh, clozapine in terms of selection and its utility in uh, treatment-resistant schizophrenia. If you look at the 1990s, the approach was more like a categorical uh, split of uh, uh, patients with clozapine uh, in schizophrenia as a responder and treatment resistant. So all other antipsychotics versus clozapine is the kind of dichotomous approach. And in the late 90s, uh, there was a revision of subcategory of treatment resistance. We had responder at one level, moderately resistant patient at the other level, and treatment resistant at the third level. Perhaps this was also motivated by the emergence of other um, recent antipsychotics or second generation antipsychotics, especially with some of the studies showed, uh, the limited set of evidence that showed you know, in a group of people uh, that had moderate levels of resistance, especially this moderate resistant are not the ones who were vigorously asserted for treatment resistance as demonstrated by the TRIP guidelines. Perhaps it was a, there was a suggestion that we can look at other antipsychotics. The current uh, concept, the treatment resistance is seen as a kind of a spectrum, a gradient of relative uh, pharmacological response. At one level, we have people that respond completely to clozapine, uh, sorry, completely to any antipsychotic. So these are uh, very good responders. So in this group of people, it is important that we avoid clozapine. Um, a clinical point I want to emphasize here is whenever we see such patients who have been excellent responder, and if there is a relapse, this is where we need to look at you know, the pseudo resistance and several factors that may uh, underlie the relapse or persistence of symptoms. And of course, if you look at the minimal responders, these are people sometimes even with the uh, first antipsychotic, there has been absolutely no response. So perhaps these are the people uh, that may come into the early treatment resistance trajectory. So we need to look at the entire treatment response as a, a, a gradient, uh, which is more like a spectrum. And uh, there is a middle portion where sometimes there could be clinical situation where we may want to preemptively initiate uh, and that is decided by several of the preferential factors that listed in one of my earlier slides. So essentially, the treatment has to be individualized, but there is no uh, evidence to support the utility of clozapine in as a first line agent. And the utility as a, a second line agent is very minimally supported, but maybe preferentially cons considered in a small subset of patients. In large majority of situation, clozapine should be used as early as possible after two definitive adequate antipsychotic trials. So with this, I will uh, conclude and uh, will just list some of the summary points I uh, made in this uh, presentation. Uh, the first and foremost point I wanted to emphasize was the optimization of treatment resistance uh, criteria. Of course, in this, there is also a recommendation for uh, a prospective Say for instance, many a time when patients come to us, there will be history of two different antipsychotic trials initially. But if you are unclear of the adequacy of treatment, it is uh, worth examining a time-bound six-week trial prospectively. But it has to be extremely time-bound and it should be again decided by several factors. That is the preferential factors for close-up initiation versus the risk for close-up initiation. The 
there is also a recommendation for considering trial with long acting injectables before going for a clozapine. That emphasized on treatment resistance versus pseudo resistant. I touched upon the dopamine supersensitivity psychosis and then the emerging role of plasma level monitoring in uh, 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 treatment with uh, clozapine. And if you look at the evidence for superior efficacy of clozapine, that is something which is fairly well established. But what is equally uh, important is the observation that we need to reduce a uh, delay in initiation of uh, clozapine. I think that's a major variable which can help us to optimally manage uh, people with treatment-resistant uh, schizophrenia. And with this, I will, I will stop by thanking several of uh, my teachers and colleagues who work uh, with us uh, here at NIMHANS in the special clinic uh, program. And thank you again uh, for the organizers towards uh, this opportunity. Um, uh, Dr. Nurul, what I had done was I had put all uh, the MCQs uh, as one slide. Um, so I was thinking I will, I'll just display those MCQ uh, slides uh, before a discussion or should I display it after discussion? Maybe I'll go by your advice. Yeah, we can proceed with the MCQ, sir. <clears throat> or maybe we can uh, discuss the... Okay, then I'll, I'll just pro project the MCQ slides and... Uh, I just made it to one slide, so yes. So these are the five MCQs which I have uh, summarized. Uh, the first MCQ is on uh, the enzyme involved in the metabolism of clozapine to nor clozapine. Uh, so I've given the four options. The second MCQ is uh, which one of the following is an FDA approved indication for prescribing clozapine? The, the third uh, MCQ is the estimated maximum delay in treatment in initiation. It at the same time, preserving clinical response in clozapine is about, you know, the four options are six years, five years, four years, and three years. The fourth MCQ is, as per the TRIP guidelines optimum requirement, recommended duration of long-acting injectable antipsychotic treatment is for how many months? That is two months, three months, four months, and six months. These are the four options. The fifth MCQ is all the following are inhibitors of clozapine metabolism except. So we have four options, uh, caffeine, rifampicin, uh, erythromycin, and uh, fluoxin. Dr. Nurul, we'll just keep the slide uh, for uh, some time. Or yes. maybe <clears throat> what you advise. If the people have answered, you can tell that. Yeah. Can I proceed with the answers? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, these are the answers, I think, for the MCQ1. Uh, uh, the enzyme involved in the metabolism of clozapine to not clozapine, it is uh, CYP1A2. And with respect to the FDA-approved indication, recurrent suicidality in schizoaffective disorder. Um, this is a indication for prescribing clozapine. So the maximum delay that we can offer uh, to in, in uh, initiating clozapine, uh, it at the same time preserving clinical response is about three years. And uh, the TRIP guidelines optimum requirement, the recommended duration of long-acting injectable antipsychotic is for about four months. 
And uh, the fifth question, um, all the following are inhibitors of uh, close-up and metabolism except rifamicin. So it is A, A, D, C, B is the sequence of uh, uh, correct answers. Um, shall I stop sharing this slide? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I have taken the photos of all the uh, uh, winners in the chat box. So I will I will go through and I will summarize the uh, winners in the chat box later, sir. We'll proceed with the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the participants? So there is one question in the chat box. So yes. what makes <clears throat> Clozapine so superior, uh, which comes in the treatment of resistance schizophrenia. Sorry, come again. I didn't get the first. Uh, so we have many molecules, but what makes clozapine superior, uh, which comes for treating the resistance schizophrenia? Yeah, I, I think this is a this is a good question. Um, since this is an established uh, view, in the sense like um, if you look at uh, the clozapine's uh, profile. It has a very unique profile in terms of a weak D2 antagonism, uh, which means uh, like some of the strong D2 antagonism related side effects are avoided. So uh, that's that's one of the reason why this molecule is found to be well tolerated in especially the patients that respond, number one. Apart from that, the profile of its noradrenergic modulation is something very unique for clozapine. So there is something called as a nor adrenergic uh, hypothesis of uh, schizophrenia. So clozapine modulates the noradrenergic aspects and the nicotinergic uh, metabol mechanisms of clozapine is another unique differential uh, feature. Uh, and this in combination with a profile of its, uh, say, as we see, as we saw, apart from the, the serotonin antagonism, which is contributing to the side effects of weight gain, there is also a 5-HT1A agonism, and there is also a 5-HT2 inverse agonism. So this profile is something which makes it very unique. And if you look at many of the recent uh, attempts in uh, discovering newer molecules, they are trying to look at, uh, you know, in terms of mimicking some of the uh, uh, sub component of these mechanisms, but perhaps what makes Clozapine unique is uh, a combination of different of these uh, receptor activities, which is uh, it to be found in any other molecule. Okay, so thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, second question, sir. Symptomatically, yeah. can we differentiate type A and type B schizophrenia? Um, no, symptomatically, it is uh, difficult to differentiate. So that is uh, where, uh, you know, there is a, a study that had used the magnetic resonance spectroscopy. The magnetic resonance spectroscopy is an imaging which is available in most of the existing scanners. So they measured the glutamate levels in the uh, anterior cingulate cortex, and that differentiated people who responded to first-line uh, antipsychotics. So in that study, they have used abisulpuride versus People that had the hyperglutamatergic state did not respond well. And these are the people who went on for treatment resistance. So clinically, there is, uh, uh, I'm not aware of any way of differentiating these two uh, groups. Uh, sir, in, you, in your experience, what is the risk of sudden death in patients who are on precipitin? It's in the chat box. Um, it is extremely rare. I have not come across any sudden deaths in the context of actually close open, whereas with uh, other antipsychotic, I have come across some of the patients, unfortunately, having sudden death. So it is extremely rare. Um, we need to be cognizant of uh, the drug-drug interactions, especially when we use close open, you know, uh, especially in pa patients that are non-responders, uh, uh, option of amisulpiride is an attractive uh, choice. So we need to be careful about the QTC monitoring. And we use QTC very extensively. Sometimes we may even overuse it in treating schizophrenia patients. So that one aspect uh, helps in avoiding the risk for sudden death. Okay, sir. The treatment resistance and clozapine-related obsessions. So how do we handle it? 
Okay. It's, it's an important uh, clinical uh, challenge. And uh, so when we see obsessions alongside closed pain, uh, we need to uh, check whether the obsessions were induced by closed pain. So in such patients, uh, my first um, option will be to see whether the dose of closed pain could be reduced. In about one third of uh, such instances, mere reduction in the dose of clozopine itself helped in uh, maintaining the clinical response with the clozopine, yet at the same time, avoiding the obsession. So that is number one. Suppose we even with the, the dose reduction, the obsessions are persistent, or if the dose reduction is not possible due to uh, the minimum dose requirement for clinical response, then add-on SSRIs is the uh, option. In, in that situation, acetylopram uh, is uh, the uh, choice of SSRI that I use mainly because it will not increase the, uh, uh, the levels of clozopine as much as other SSRIs. And in patients where we are unable to handle with uh, this uh, add-on SSRI, and if the obsessions are significant, uh, this group of patients I have found ECT to help. Although uh, the standard recommendation or the standard uh, uh, understanding is that the role of ECT in uh, OCD is very minimal. In patients that have coexisting uh, OCD, either de novo or drug induced, I have found add on ECT to be very helpful. The other experimental treatment that we find very useful is add on treatment with transcranial direct current stimulation. Uh, you know, of course, the transcranial direct current stimulation when we use some montage which may help us to handle both obsessions and positive symptoms in schizophrenia. So this is what we use, but this is still a an experimental option. Yeah, sir. So, uh, uh, considering the time constraints, sir, so we'll allow for another four or five questions. Uh, we'll discuss with that. Uh, <clears throat> the effect of the do clozapine have superiority in addressing the negative symptoms of schizophrenia? Okay. Yeah. The, the utility of uh, clozapine in addressing negative symptoms in studies wise, it is found to be very useful. So when negative symptoms co-occur as a part of treatment resistance, clozapine has helped because some, of, some component of this negative symptom could be secondary. Whereas if the negative symptom is primary, uh, in my experience, I have not found clozapine to be uh, that much efficacious. I generally try either um, amisulpride, and this is one indication where other molecules like aripiprazole add on SSRI. And recently, we have found from our yoga research by Dr. Shivrama, the utility of yoga seems to be very good in people that have persistent negative symptoms as a single symptom dimension. Okay. And another question, sir. So, is a kind of practice related question. Um, is there any role of low dose clozapine as seen in multiple prescriptions, bracket 50 milligram, as an adjuvant with other antipsychotics in treatment resistance? Uh, so, th this is a clinically useful option, but not at researched well. Um, so, th so th this is an option which we have used sparingly in patients where we couldn't use higher dose of clozapine or uh, patients where we found that, you know, when we were titrating clozapine with an existing antipsychotic. For instance, there is a patient with who's on risperidone as a second molecule with treatment resistance. We start clozapine. There is a response even with a lower dose. And, uh, as we start building up clozapine dose, um, the side effects are intolerable. And uh, if we have also noticed in such a situation, reduction in uh, the dose of risperidone, um, could be one other factor that might be aggravating the situation. So during cross titration, a careful observation may help us to identify a subset of patients. So maybe four milligram of risperidone with say 25 to 50 milligram of uh, clozapine in which we carefully document monotherapy with either of the agent was insufficient. And there was a window of uh, uh, say four milligram of clozapine and 25 to 50 milligram of, uh, so four milligram of risperidone and 25 to 50 milligram of clozapine was useful. So we carefully document and we uh, continue. But this is an area which is uh, worth uh, exploring. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So the another question on uh, rechallenging clozapine uh, for people who developed uh, uh, adverse effects like agranulocytosis, seizure. So your comments on that? Um, Rechallenge with agranulocytosis? No. 
rechallenge with myocarditis no whereas all other side effects of uh, clozapine you know we can rechallenge seizure um, is an eminently handleable situation because it's a dose dependent uh, phenomena number one number two we can use concurrent anti epileptics uh, you know mm -hmm. uh, lamotrigine is one attractive option to consider because it will both act as a uh, prophylactic for epilepsy as well as as a add on molecule to enhance the effects of uh, clozapine in treatment resistant population alternative options are valproate and phenytoin yeah, the, and the last two questions sir the one is uh, dose titration guideline to reduce chances of dopamine super sensitive psychosis and second question um, the guidelines for use of clozapine in older age groups especially in the parkinson and other disorders any <laughs> comments on that sir Right. So, dose, uh, so the, 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 the dose titration guidelines and uh, dopamine super sensitivity is mainly because we need to be proactive in ensuring we do not over treat with higher dose of antipsychotics, which means that if we treat with, say, for instance, risperidone 6 milligram, the person responds excellent. And over a period of uh, uh, three to six months after the response, we should proactively aim at reducing the dose and keep the patient on minimum effective dose, especially if there is a co-occurring extrapyramidal symptom. So that is a rough indicator of uh, more D2 antagonism. So it is essentially a proactive uh, attempt towards optimizing the dose of uh, medication is important. For instance, in the context of dose reduction, if we are very clear that supersensitivity psychosis emerges, it is useful to add on, uh, you know, weak dopamine antagonists, say, for instance, quetiapine for a brief period, and then see whether the person could be maintained on quetiapine monotherapy or come back to monotherapy with the previous agent. So usually it will be a strong D2 antagonist like risperidone or haloperidol, but at a lower dose. Coming to the dose titration guidelines in either of the age extremes, uh, uh, we have to be as much slow as possible. Uh, to the extent something like a dose increments of 12.5 milligram, which can be spread over a period of uh, anywhere from four to eight days in terms of dose increment. So this is the uh, approach we follow. So the last question from my side, sir. Uh, sir, what, what, do, what do you advise uh, the, as a dose of clozapine for the Indian population epidemiologically? Okay. Uh, I think that's second thing, we, we don't do much uh, serum analysis of clozapine uh, when the patients are clozapine. So what are the other proxy markers that we can uh, see in order to titrate the clozapine? Yeah, yeah. I think there was a slide which was not there in my final presentation. I actually put the studies that we published from our center on the clozapine um, dosage and its corresponding uh, serum levels. So a dose range from 150 to 300 would be optimal in majority of the patients. You know, so that is the dose range. Um, clozapine level monitoring is preferred, but not mandatory given the resource limitation. But uh, uh, the, the approach would be more like uh, examining for specific uh, side effects, especially the sedation is one side effect. If it is persistent, you know, usually the sedation should wane off after four to six weeks if it is persistent. So that is one. The second important uh, side effect will be uh, related to the uh, occurrence of hypersalivation. You know, this is something which we found. If hypo hypersalivation starts happening, then perhaps we need to relook increasing the dose of close-up versus maintaining at the same dose. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for the great presentation, sir. Uh, from uh, Vidya Kumar, sir, and Dr. Panisaran, sir, some com summarizing comments. Yeah, is uh, Panir Selvam there? Uh, am I audible, uh, Shwats? Yes, sir, you are audible, sir. Kindly continue, sir. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, wonderful, uh, mind blowing, uh, very lucid and informative lecture, sir. Uh, very uh, uh, important points you have been uh, given to us. Uh, close up in. Uh, combination with the fluoxamine is very uh, new to us. I think uh, it is very useful combination to deal about uh, weight gain and uh, uh, hyperglycemia. Uh, I'm just uh, uh, feeling wonder, uh, wonder about uh, lamatrogen use 
uh, when uh, clozapine fails. That is the only point. Uh, I'm not bothered about memantin, but uh, lamantrazine use in uh, when uh, clozapine fails, uh, that is, uh, I think, uh, uh, a question from my side to the speaker, sir. Uh, I think uh, this uh, very wonderful lecture, I think, uh, uh, I, I, I think uh, this is a very beautiful uh, uh, he has brought uh, many of the important points regarding clozapine. I think uh, most of the pieces would have been uh, got benefited. Uh, if he can answer that uh, question, I think I'll be very happy about why uh, lamatrazine is used when uh, clozapine is failed. Yeah, I think that's a very important option, sir. The lamotrigine, what you pointed out, is amongst the first option. So either like ECT is something which we will consider alongside in terms of a longer term, lamotrigine, amisulfuride, these are two promising options. Lamotrigine is a preferred one because it doesn't add to the any newer side effect except for uh, the risk for skin rash, which happens very rarely. If that period is crossed, lamotrigine is an excellent choice. And what we have found is when we use lamotrigine, we may have to go up to a dose of uh, at least uh, close to 200 to anywhere up to 400. And usually the good response uh, takes a little longer time. And we have found people to show striking benefits uh, over a period of anywhere from eight weeks to 16 weeks. All that uh, additional benefits happen. And those that respond well, uh, you know, it makes a major change in the clinical uh, presentation. So it's an important option to consider when we have close up and non-responding uh, patients, residual symptoms even after close up and treatment. Thank you for, you know, bringing up this important. No, wonderful, sir. Wonderful. I'm very happy, sir. From my side also, I say thanks to you to bring about a lot of good things about this close up and sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Go to Paneer Selvam. Uh, sir, kindly unmute yourself, sir. Paneer, sir. Sir, kindly unmute yourself, sir. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Venkata Sumaya, for your wonderful and very informative presentation. As you said, the clozapine is a very wonderful molecule. But many of our clinicians are very hesitant to start the clozapine because of fearing of this agronulocytosis. I want to ask Dr. Venkata Sumaya, what is your experience of agronulocytosis in our Indian population? Um, uh, like the agronulocytosis is extremely rare in the sense we uh, actually now the the guidelines are moving towards the question whether we need to do monitoring as frequently as it is recommended. Um, in, in people that have the risk for agranulocytosis, usually it happens uh, within the first uh, six months, most often within the first three months. So in those uh, period, that is the first to 12 weeks, if we monitor them with weekly blood count, that picks up uh, agranulocytosis almost always. Um, and uh, so, so, which means, and if you are able to pick it up much early in all patients that we have treated, where there is a reduction in the leukocyte uh, count uh, with uh, periodic monitoring, in, uh, in everybody, when we stopped the clozapine, the, the reduction in the count got reversed. So, so that is something which is very encouraging. So it's, since it's a rare side effect, uh, we need to be very careful uh, but at the same time, we need not be extremely alarmed because of the side effect to avoid the close effect. Thank you, Dr. In, the far, in my practice of 25 years of practice, I have not seen any, even a single case of agronulocytosis. Have you ever, ever come across a character in new hands? Yes, maybe because uh, the number of uh, treatment resistant patients yes. that we get exposed to are more. We have, we, I, I can remember a handful of uh, such patients uh, where we, uh, I know these are patients who are tried with the next best antipsychotic and maybe add on ECT. So that's how we handle. Uh, but the risk is extremely minimum. Thank you, Dr. Venkatsuri. Thank you, Venkatsuri, for your wonderful presentation. And more than 200 participants were there till your end of your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uday Kumar, sir, for sparing your valuable time to chat this session. And I also thank Dr. Noor Levin and Dr. Aswan and all the participants, postgraduates, for your patient listening and, and as well as for a fruitful discussion. The YouTube the link is available. Uh, so when you can ask with Dr. Noor Levin or uh, this was Vama, they will provide you. And our next uh, 
the evolve cmbb on 23rd april 2024 the topic and the speaker will be inform you soon and my special thanks to the sponsor is to pharma uh, dr Pra mr pravin you can you can give a word of thanks very good dr mr pravin is for pharma to give a word of thanks then you can wind up the session thank you very much doctor i it is our privilege to have a wonderful program with our east west pharma doctor we organized so uh, and also doctor the, we, we can see day by day the, uh, the acceptance and the pg's benefit also be increased doctor to today two medical colleges a big team has had from orissa also so and also the many, during the during during the program itself the pg started asking the link and uh, everything we are giving the informations and uh, we very well to the organizers doctor nurul hasan and especially thanks to doctor venkat sir has given wonderful session to us uh, over benefit of our pg's and uh, surely we will continue with the program doctor and thank you so much for the giving opportunity for east west pharma and for the pg's benefit any link for this program you can contact our east west pharma medical representatives and also the link in the chat box i have given my number also you can contact my mail id and my number also we will get the link also doctor thank you so much doctor thank you thank you pravin thank you sir yeah i've seen many people from andhra karnataka kerala that's also north east state also joined it. Thank you. It has become global event then. <laughs> <laughs> so, sir, yeah, this actually the uh, exam period. Many postgraduates uh, finally oh, oh. at the uh, exam, and uh, so the dissertation submission with me was there. In spite of that, more than two hundred people have died. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Doctor Venkat. Noodle, Doctor Noodle. Ah uh, yes, sir. Uh, you noted out all the. Yes, yeah. sir. Actually, since uh, actually we have displayed uh, all the questions in a single slide, sir. Yeah. So people have uh, answered in different timings. So we'll go through once, and then we'll finalize the list yeah, of the group. Yeah, we can next. Yeah, we can next meeting. We can announce. Yes, thank sir. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir.